Dimitri, in the book, you describe Russia as a paragon of pragmatism that is able to straddle various fault lines. Would you expound on that a little bit and, and uh, tell me how you, uh, how you came to that conclusion or, or why you think that? Well, good, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for staying uh, through this panel. Um, first of all, Liz, I really thank you for the words that I probably don't deserve. Um, the book is a, is, 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 is a long essay, nothing more than that. And I do not claim to be a, um, a student of Middle Eastern politics or even geopolitics. My focus has always been and remains Russia, Russia's foreign policy. Um, I think in response to your question, Liz, everyone learns uh, best through one's own mistakes. Uh, Russia as a, or the Russian Federation as a new name for the country, for the old country that was known as the Soviet Union before, that was known as the Russian Empire even before that, um, has had a whole lot of things to learn. One of the things that uh, Russia learned the hard way was that um, an ideologically based foreign policy is a recipe for disaster. That um, going around the world, um, spending money leaves you broke. That uh, in this world of uh, um, when, when ideological antagonism is a thing of the past, or maybe um, a ghost of the past, uh, there is nothing in this world other than various interests that compete among themselves. And uh, the best way for a country to manage the world, its, its own position in the world, is to be, uh, as you just said, pragmatic, meaning that you follow your own interest, first and last. You have some kind of a concept of the world order, but you do not try to impose it on, on other people. That um, there's no one in this world who will be your enemy forever. There's no one in this world who will be your ally forever. Uh, Russia's uh, worst allies in Afghanistan, worst enemies in Afghanistan, the uh, Mujahideen, who chased the Soviet Union out of the country, uh, a decade later turned into Russia's allies against uh, the Taliban. Now you may argue the Taliban could be seen, and certainly is seen by some in Russia, as a potential ally against a worse enemy, i.e. ISIS, or IS, or Daesh, or however you, you call them. So that's, uh, that, that's, that's the learning process. And I think that from the Russian standpoint, the Middle East is your, um, is your classic region of competing geopolitical interests. And uh, Russia's return to the Middle East is uh, astounding for how it differs from the Soviet Union's first venture into the region. So that will be my, my answer to your question. And what, what you're saying is that Russia has learned from its mistakes of the past something that other countries don't always master. Um, and at Af Afghanistan, I mean, you mentioned Afghanistan, um, and given Russia's experience in Afghanistan, one would think that Russia might be, or the Soviet Union's experience in Afghanistan, to be technically correct, yeah, um, that there might be a reluctance to get deeply involved in another conflict in a part of the world where, um, yes, there are geostrategic interests, but there's no shared border, there's no, you know, this, this wasn't the country next door. 
Um, so what tipped the balance for Russia to make the decision in 2015 to up things in Syria? Right. Well, before I answer that, let me just say, let me add, add an asterisk. Um, Russia has not, has not learned all the lessons. There are still things to learn. That's one. Two, um, you learn most and you learn best when you are defeated. And um, Russia was defeated. Uh, I would say the, the political system in Russia was defeated by the Russian people. And Russia's uh, geopolitical posture was defeated primarily because of because because the uh, the fort itself could not hold the house itself divided. So basically, I'm saying that uh, all these lessons come at a very high price. And um, that 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 that's my asterisk. In 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 response. To your question, I would say that um, Putin is about, as I see him, and I may be wrong, Putin is about two things in the world. One is uh, to keep Russia in one piece, and that's the overriding goal of any Russian leader. The country is brittle. You can mismanage it. The country is also built in such a way that when the center doesn't hold, the whole thing may go down the drain. Uh, it all came to Gorbachev at some point for the uh, uh, huge juggernaut called the Soviet Union to collapse. Things could have, could have ended differently. The Soviet Union could be alive today. It's not, the Soviet Union was not, well, it was doomed in the longer historical process, but it was not doomed to die in 1991. Things could have run differently. Um, so Putin is about this, keeping Russia in one piece. But the other thing that he is about is elevating Russia's position to that of a great power, seen as such by the rest of the world. And I think that Syria was not about Syria. It's not even about the Middle East. It was about um, the world order and Russia's standing in that world order. Now let me explain. Uh, Syria was a war of choice. I would say that from the Kremlin's standpoint, Ukraine was a war of defense against what was perceived to be a political invasion of Russia's geopolitical turf, if you like. And any Russian leader would have responded in some way. Uh, Syria, you could argue that uh, had Russia not intervened, uh, um, Bashar al-Assad would uh, probably been, been toppled, and I think that was the calculus in Moscow. Um, the opposition might have uh, proclaimed the victory in, in uh, Damascus. The victory would have probably been short-lived, and other forces would have triumphed, may have proclaimed the caliphate from the rooftops of Damascus. Uh, a lot of countries would have suffered, um, including Russia, but not in the first place. As you said uh, correctly, uh, Syria does not have a shared border with Russia. Uh, although the uh, IS did attract um, uh, a couple of dozen thousand uh, ex-Soviet and some of them still Russian citizens under its uh, black flags, um, it was not a given that, the, that, that having uh, scored a, a major victory there, they would have turned, the, turned north. Um, Putin, I think, decided to act. Of course, he had all these things in his mind when he was a bailing out Bashar, uh, killing, uh, or making sure, let's put it in a more elegant way, making sure that those uh, Russian citizens who went to go to, who went for Syria would not return, that they would stay in Syria. And many of them did stay in Syria as a result. Uh, and that uh, Putin, his political career was started uh, in the 
Chechen war. And he was saying at that time publicly that if we do not st stop the rot in Chechnya, then we may lose the whole country. The, the rot will spread and the other areas will, uh, will go under and we will lose the country. Uh, so you can, you can still argue that this was a relevant, a relevant issue for, for Putin um, in 2015. But I think an even more important thing was to, to, um, to make sure that everyone sees it, everyone hears it, that you cannot topple a government that we choose to protect, either from the inside or from the outside. And uh, in, in a way, this was a, an attempt to reverse the, uh, the Arab, both the Arab Spring and the regime change from the outside with one stop. And I think that was, was Putin's, uh, Putin's game. Uh, but having decided on that intervention, he made sure that uh, Syria would not become Afghanistan for, 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 for Russia. And that was a very serious concern. Um, my own colleagues uh, on the staff of the uh, Carnegie Moscow Center, particularly middle-aged women, came to my office in uh, September, October 2015 for a private briefing, for a private consultation. And they had just one question on their mind. And the question was, what's the likelihood that my son would, would be called up and sent to fight in Syria? So that was clearly a major concern. And Putin, uh, Putin is a risk taker. Uh, in this case, it was a well-calculated risk. He fought a war that is very different from all the wars that Russia, i.e. the Soviet Union, the Russian Empire, or the Russian Federation of today has ever fought. This is a war in a country that does not share a border with Russia. I don't think we ever did that. Well, we did that, but uh, in, 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 in the uh, pre-modern times. Um, but not in modern times. It was a war with uh, uh, the land forces uh, in, a support in, a, uh, in, a, in a support function, not a, in the function of combat forces. Um, it was more of a US style operation. You bomb from the air and from the sea. Uh, there is little chance that you, you will get hurt by people firing back because they don't have the weapons. And um, you, uh, you use allies on the ground. The Syrians, the Shiites, the Iranians, whoever. And uh, that was a risk for sure. It was not clear that this war would be, uh, would be what it has been in the past two years, that the casualties of the Russian forces would be measured in, in uh, double digits. I think the official count is 41. The unofficial is 76. Um, so it was a calculated risk, and yet he took that risk. For him, I think there's a maxim. Russia is nothing if not the great power. It is a matter of survival for Russia to be treated primarily by the mightiest nations in the world, starting with the United States, as a great power. If we're not treated as a great power, then we'll lose our sovereignty, then we'll lose, our, we'll lose everything. In, in terms of international standing. That, that's the idea. So, so you described this as a, a war of choice and as uh, sort of hitting two birds with one stone. I would argue more than two birds. Um, it's a, more than a twofer, as we would say, uh, in that Russia uh, demonstrates domestically that the rot will not be tolerated. It's a reaction to the Arab Spring and specifically, I think, to the Libya situation. Uh, reaction to regime change is a, a red line, if you will, for, for, for us. Um, and it, is, it signals Russia's return to the world stage as a great power. And Russia now is playing 
a role in the region, in the Middle East, uh, A, that it has never really played before, but B, that the United States played in, in many instances before. So it's, it's sort of supplanted the United States in some ways. Is that what you're saying? Not, and I hope that's not the, I hope it's not the way it will be seen in Moscow. It would be a huge mistake for, for Moscow to try to supplant the United States in this region. As I said a, a moment ago, Russia is, um, is, is, um, is, is going abroad not to spend money, not to issue commitments, not to impose order or protect an order. It's um, um, going abroad to earn money um, by, uh, by, by fighting the way Russia has, fight, has fought in, in the region, by um, um, bailing out someone who had been taken for dead by a lot of people. Russia has uh, increased its prestige. That is convertible into arms contracts, into uh, other forms of uh, financial transactions that, be that benefit Russia. As I said, it's not after a regional order, except that it doesn't want uh, domestic regime change and it doesn't want uh, revolutions to spread the way. Um, so I'm not suggesting that Russia is trying to supplant the United States. No one can and no one will, in my view. The United States is truly um, unique in the way it has uh, uh, managed world affairs uh, since the end of the uh, Second World War. I don't think there's, but the Soviet Union sort of tried in its own way uh, and failed, frankly. Didn't have enough resources for that. Um, so I don't think that that will be the conclusion. Russia is a major power and it's through its own eyes, hopefully from Russia's standpoint in the eyes of so many others, but it's not a superpower. It will not, um, it will not guarantee um, regimes around the Middle East. It will not seek um, to um, impose solutions on, on, on others. But uh, it will try, I think, a different role, different from all the roles it has also, as you said, all the roles it has played before. The role of some kind of a facilitator, mediator, a country which is big enough to be taken seriously, an independent player, no one can dictate to Russia. That, that's the new, I think, the new description of a great power is not a power that imposes itself on others. It is a power that does not let anyone, anyone at all, including the United States of America, to impose upon itself. And that's the definition. And I think that Russia is seeking to be that kind of power. So it may be a, a useful, um, a useful participant in so many uh, things happening in this region. For example, in Libya, there, there's a Russian, growing Russian role, more diplomatic than, uh, than, than military, much more diplomatic than military. In Syria, the role will, will eventually be more diplomatic than military. Again, it's, uh, there, there's a change of role. Other players are coming in. Other players will be more important uh, than they have been before. We're talking reconstruction. That means that the people who will be spending their money in Syria will have a more will have more say on, on how Syria is governed and how Syria is how the Syrian conflict is eventually settled. Russia will take a somewhat you know a back seat on those things, but it will still be a player for for a number of reasons. The issue is not to be uh, to. Um, to bask in the limelight of a, of, a, of a superpower. The issue is to earn money, as I said, to, uh, pr to uh, be respected as a major player, not the dominant player, but a major player, and uh, to, um, to use its uh, foreign engagement to uh, eventually to uh, improve, the, the improve Russia's overall standing uh, in the world, which will be a very, very difficult task. The transactional uh, nature to Russian engagement in the region as opposed to some sort of grand strategy for the region.
with that. There, there's no grand strategy uh, that I can see. And uh, even I, would, I, I sometimes uh, ask myself the question, is there a strategy for Syria, for example? Uh, that was going to be my next question. Is there an exit strategy? <laughs> uh, I was not going to... I was, uh, well, exit strategy is part of this. I was talking more about a grand strategy for Syria. Exit... Uh, well, the, uh, the, there's a partial exit that Putin has announced, and that's, uh, that's all there is to it. Uh, this exit is, um, as I said, partial. Um, planes um, have a have a capacity to return within hours if they need, if, if they need to be returned. Uh, again, it's very light presence in that sense. Uh, so Russia can be back. Um, it's, it wants to keep its uh, two bases in, the, in, in, in Syria. It certainly wants to keep its political influence in Syria, or at least a measure of political influence, which will be contested by including by some of Russia's own allies. Battlefield allies will now be political competitors, which is normal. People understand that. Um, but uh, there is no exit strategy in the sense that uh, Russia will quit the region, I don't think. But uh, reducing its level of engagement, yes, that, that, that's happening. It could be also increased if circumstances demand. In your piece, you describe Russia as not having either permanent allies or permanent enemies. Um, so that, and this sort of goes, uh, carries on from the, the notion of a transactional relationship. Right. Um, could you talk a little bit about Russia's relationship with Iran? Because on the one hand, Russia and Iran are closely allied in Syria. But on the other hand, Russia was uh, front and center in, with the P5 plus one in negotiating the JCPOA. So Russia can be uh, on one side of the table on one issue and, and on another side of the table uh, on another issue with the right. same country, um, which is, is something, I mean, it's, it's not rare, but it's a, little, it's a little different than the approach that other countries take sometimes. It certainly is. Um, Russia's relationship with Iran is long and uh, very complex. One thing that every Russian uh, schoolboy or schoolgirl will learn at school in the fifth form, I think, is that uh, uh, the ambassador of the entire embassy in Tehran were massacred. All of them, except for one Cossack, were killed in 1829. And they learn that not in history lessons, but rather in the lessons of literature, because the ambassador happened to be a very famous Russian playwright uh, whose uh, works uh, are actually not only studied but learned by heart by Russian children. So this is a chilling uh, lesson in history that, that you get from, uh, from, from, from that story. Um, the relationship is, uh, as I said, the relationship is pretty um, uh, complex. Uh, the Russians are largely uh, free from um, particularly bad feelings toward the Iranians because they, uh, they have always been on the winning side in the last uh, 200 years. Uh, they occupied uh, Iran in, the f in both world wars. Uh, the Tehran conference of the big three, the United States, Russia, uh, Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom was held in, in the territory uh, occupied by the Soviet forces at that time. Um, so it's, uh, the Iranians clearly resent that. In the, uh, I once read uh, uh, part of the speech of the Iranian delegate to the Versailles Conference, and he uh, fulminated about half the Iranian state being uh, taken over by the Russian Empire. So they have very strong uh, resentment uh, regarding what Russia did to them in, in, in the 19th century. Now, we, we feel, I think, in Russia more relaxed about Iran in principle, but um, certainly the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979 um, sent, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
pretty strong and pretty unsettling signal all the way to the Kremlin. And uh, of course, the United States was uh, the, the grand Satan to uh, the leaders of the Islamic Revolution, but the Soviet Union was the little Satan. It was still a Satan. And um, again, there, there's no love lost. But as, as you said, it's a very transactional relationship. It's about, this is a classic example, that you have an alignment of interest. You know, there was an alignment of interest in Syria between Russia and Iran, uh, at least during the war. With the war drawing to a close, uh, there's more competition between Iran and Russia because the Russian vision of the future of Syria differs significantly from the Iranian vision of the future of Syria. Uh, not to speak of the Iranian vision of the future of the region or Iranian interests in the region. They are strictly Iranian interests. Russia has other interests in the region. So you, 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 you will have more, more competition. On the other hand, Russians see Iran as, a, as an important part of, uh, of the region, as an important part of Eurasia that is expanding. Thanks to our Chinese friends, it's becoming a more integrated macro region, stretching all the way from the British Isles to, the, to, the, to Japan. And uh, Iran is a, big, uh, is a big chunk of that. And Russia clearly wants to have a good relationship with that country, and using, its, using the opportunities, including those offered by uh, the tension existing between the United States and to a degree Europe on the one hand and Iran on the other. So Russia is, uh, is clearly, in, a, in an opportunistic way, is using this, uh, the, this situation. But it's also treading very carefully because as you, you, you mentioned uh, uh, Iran and, um, uh, and um, uh, Russia managing both Iran and Israel at the same time. Russia not o is not only sitting down with the P5 plus one uh, uh, on the Iranian table, it's also managing its relationship with Iran on, on, in, the, in one hand and Israel in the other hand. Again, also on the nuclear issue. It, it, takes, um, it takes some um, skill, I think that's the word. Uh, to manage it. Another relationship Russia is seeking to manage is between Iran and Saudi Arabia. But that's not the only one, uh, that, that, not, not, not that Iran is, is not an exception, it's more the rule. If R Russia is also seeking to manage its relations with Turkey on the one hand and Cur the Kurds on the other hand. And I can continue, go on and on and on. Uh, there was, in, in a very um, illustrative case, I think, um, we talked, we spent part of the morning discussing uh, uh, the Trump statement on Jerusalem. Uh, not everyone would know that there was, uh, maybe in this, in this room most would, but still, uh, that there was a Russian foreign ministry statement earlier this year on, on the same issue. And the Russian statement basically ran, well, we recognize for a fact, and you cannot dispute that, for a fact, that West Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And that's where a lot of diplomatic business is transacted. But we also believe that with the um, implementation of the two-state solution, East Jerusalem will be the capital of Palestine. Now that's the Russian way of, of, of going around issues such as the status of Jerusalem. That extra word West uh, makes a big difference, huh? yeah. <laughs> Um, you've described Russia's diplomacy in the Middle East as a, as a bazaar, where goods are traded back and forth and alliances shift. What do you think Russia expects from the U.S. in the Middle East? I mean, going forward, uh, you just mentioned the, the uh, Trump administration, President Trump's position on Jerusalem. Um, Russia has been a member of the quartet working on the peace process since the beginning. Um, Russia 
Russia has been involved in, in virtually everything in, in the Middle East, either directly or as a member of the Security Council. Going forward, and since we're supposed to be projecting into 2018, um, what do you see as Russia's perspective on the U.S. And, and how Russia will interact with the U.S. on the Middle East? Well, I think it's a very difficult question. Uh, not so much about Russia's um, um, response or Russia's attitude or Russia's expectation. But uh, I think the question on, 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 on the back of so many Russian minds, well, those, of course, those few who are concerned with the issue, is what is U.S. strategy in the region? And, um, and that, I think, is still not, not, not clear. I think that uh, the Russians, uh, when they first uh, thought about um, dealing with the, the, the Syrian war before their intervention, say 2013. Um, the idea when Secretary Kerry came to the Kremlin, uh, at the very start of the second presidency of Barack Obama, and had a meeting, a very good one, with Putin, um, the idea in the Kremlin was that uh, um, the United States and Russia would try to do uh, what I would call a Dayton Adu in Syria. That jointly, the two big powers will lean on their protégés or their proxies, their allies, whatever, bring them to the negotiating table and uh, make sure that they do a deal. Just like um, Richard Holbrook was able to do that yeah, Dayton, Ohio, but um, not single-handedly, rather jointly, uh, through the, the efforts of both countries. And, and the Russians thought that this would mean the United States' acceptance of Russia's role as a great power in the region. So they wanted, uh, again, through that peace deal that never came to pass, uh, they wanted status. Russia is, I said, I can say it in a different word, in a different way. Russia is in first and foremost in foreign affairs about status. It's not about uh, some kind of, Soviet Union was an aberration. Well, Russia is about status. What, what kind of status do we have in that system? We don't, we don't care that much about the system itself. What we care most about is where we stand in that system. And I would even say that the only thing that Russia loves the United, the United Nations for is its uh, permanent seat on the UN Security Council. That's it. That's it. Now, uh, I agree on this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Dayton was never to be Dayton Adur was never to be consummated. So Russia had to do things differently. And yet Kerry and Lavrov, uh, the Russian Foreign Minister, met uh, many, many times in. 2015, 2016, and uh, spent a lot of time, maybe more than they spent with their wives discussing uh, the Syrian issue. It, it never resulted in, in, a, in, a, in real cooperate, diplomatic cooperation. As people in Moscow suspect, uh, primarily because of the reluctance or unwillingness of parts of the US administration, of the Obama administration to um, to cooperate too closely with the Russians. Again, we're talking about post-Ukraine, post-Crimea, uh, and all that. Um, and since then, the Russians decided to reach the same goal, but going by a different route. And instead of a Dayton Adur, uh, we had just last month a trio sitting in Sochi. Uh, the Russians, the Turks, and the Iranians discussing Syria. And this is, this is the trajectory, and this is the change that has happened in, 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 in four years, four and a half years' time. From a date and order with the United States that never took place to a trio of, uh, of Russia and the two uh, key Middle Eastern non-Arab states uh, dealing essentially with the same issue. Again, for Russia, the, I, the issue is not with whom. 
the issues of what Russia's role, what Russia's status will be. Um, so I think that they are now asking themselves, what is, um, what is the United States up to in the, in the Middle East? The United States is not much of a problem for Russia, frankly, today. Uh, the United States is, is active in Syria, but deconfliction works. And the United States, uh, again, seen from the Russian side, has given up uh, uh, any thought of, uh, of, uh, um, of uh, toppling the Bashar al-Assad regime. And there are even some suggestions that the United States might tolerate the regime for another three, four years. Um, again, whether true or false. We live in this age of fake news, who knows? Um, but that, that, but that, that's where we are. I think the, issue, the question is uh, what the United States will, will do. There, there's no problem for Russia to collaborate with the United States on issues. There's no, Rus the United States, unlike Russia in the US, the US in, in Russia may be um, hated by some, um, there may be a lot of resentment against the United States, but the United States is not toxic. If, if you need to engage with the United States, you go ahead and do that. Because for Russia, engaging with the United States on the terms acceptable to Russia actually elevates Russia's status. For the United States, it would be a concession to a country deemed to be what Russia is deemed to be in, 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 in the United States today. For Russia, it's, it's the other way. So they will be looking and uh, watching, and uh, if there is uh, an opportunity to engage, uh, they will, uh, on, on, on the right terms, transactional relationship, uh, they will uh, seize upon that opportunity, I think. Thank you, Dimitri. I'm, I'm conscious of, I don't want to monopolize the, the time here, so why don't we throw it open to questions. As always, please um, let us know who you are and uh, keep it to a question not a statement. Uh, here comes the mic. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Michel Zovikian. My question is, if Russia is coming to Syria to make money, where is the money going to come from? Syria does not have money, and uh, GCC will probably not give money to where will they make the money from? Uh, very good question. Um, I think that um, uh, it, it's interesting. Sometimes it's precisely the people you're working against who will be your, um, your, your best partners or creditors. So my, the question, answer number one, Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been... Um, warming up to Russia as part of its general diversification of foreign policy. But it's also been uh, um, watchful and uh, having seen uh, Russia's diplomatic, political, and military performance, uh, they, I think that they've concluded that they could uh, and should do something with the Russians. The UAE uh, and some other Gulf states um, the, the, you, you can also get Saudi money uh, in, in a roundabout way. You sell arms to Egypt. And Egypt doesn't have the money. Part of the money will come from others. That might include Saudi Arabia. You've also entered into a, an interesting uh, uh, agreement on uh, oil, fixing the oil price with the Saudis, the OPEC, non-OPEC, uh, with Russia playing a very interesting role also as a facilitator of the agreement uh, with Putin actually uh, playing the part of a go-between uh, in the Saudi-Iranian relationship, which is very interesting. So what you have is, um, is uh, you show um, what, what you can do and, um, and, and people will come to you. I think that's, that's the basic idea. And then there are other countries. There's a country called Libya, not far away, uh, where Russia is also trying diplomatically and, uh, and maybe in some other ways. And it's a richer country than, uh, than Syria. Um, 
Maybe some reconstruction projects will be co-managed, or I don't know. At least there's some hope that Russia could get a pie of that, or a piece of that pie. Uh, that would be my answer. Not a complete answer, but part of the answer. Yes, right here. No. My name is Sarah Siaj. Uh, you have talked about the Russian troops will partially uh, exit from uh, Syria and not fully exit from Syria. Do you have further explanation regarding this point and any time frame from your side? Uh, another question. What do you think the government of Syria expectation from the government of Russia and what are the government of Russia expectations from the government of Syria, if you have any thoughts regarding the interaction between both governments? No, there's no timetable, and I don't think there will be a timetable. There's no pressure for a timetable um, from, uh, from the Russian population. Uh, Russia, again, I was talking about a US-style war. Russia has a conscript army in principle, but uh, the troops uh, and uh, personnel, let's put it that way, who are sent to Syria are all contract soldiers. So they are professional soldiers, uh, and um, uh, you're, you're dealing with a different kind of, this is what I told my, uh, my colleagues at the Carnegie Moscow Center, don't worry, your sons are safe, they will not be sent to Syria. Of course I was out on the limb for a period of time, but. That that's the way it turned out to be. Um, so there's no timetable, and uh, actually, it's not so much the troops that are an issue. It's uh, uh, it's it's the uh, it's the aircraft that are that are the Russia is not fighting there with big battalions. It's fighting there with uh, a couple of dozen aircraft. That's that's all that Russia has in Syria. Um, the Russian expectations, I think, uh, are that uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, becomes more uh, flexible and uh, goes for some meaningful compromise with the opposition. Otherwise, you won't, you won't have a political solution. Russia has no problem bombing the opposition to the negotiating table, as it has been doing. But uh, it is the idea of bringing them to the negotiating table, not destroying them, that is behind the Russian tactic. Uh, my impression is, without being a Middle East expert, is that Bashar al-Assad thinks more in terms of a total victory and total control, which I think the Russians believe uh, cannot be implemented and should not be implemented because that's a recipe for, for another uh, uh, upheaval down the road. So I think there'll be, um, it's, it's a difficult, it's, relations with adversaries are difficult, but relations with allies are even more so, doubly so. So I think it's going to be a difficult relationship and um, I hope that the Russians have enough um, enough power of persuasion using different tools of uh, now bringing Bashar al-Assad to the negotiati negotiating table and making him negotiate uh, seriously. On the other hand, the Russians are not uh, happy with uh, the more radical position taken by the members of the opposition. So you have to you have to work with a lot of people, some of them your allies, some of them your adversaries, or at least those whom you, uh, you know, bombed a little bit to the negotiating table. Uh, that's, that, that, that's, that's the issue. I don't know how, I, I, I would say that uh, the task before, before Moscow today is more difficult than the task until, until yesterday, essentially. So the, the task of, uh, of, of achieving a military victory or a military success, if you like, uh, was comparatively easier than the task of achieving a political settlement. But that will be the proof of the quality 
of, uh, of Russian diplomatic skills. We'll see. I don't know. Um, in the front row here. Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mitri Vitalievich, for your excellent and instructive uh, presentation today. Uh, just two quick questions first. How would you see the balance between uh, contradiction and commonalities with respective Iranian and Russian national interest in the post-conflict Syria? And the second, wouldn't you think that uh, unexpectedly the Washington decision to recognize Jerusalem as capital of Israel could be played as a Trump card for Russian diplomacy for moving forward on the peace process? Well, on the first question, I think that uh, the, the big issue between Russia and Iran in Syria is um, not so much between Russia, but Russia will have to, 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 to deal with that, is the scope and uh, nature of the Iranian presence in Syria post-war. I think the Russians, uh, the basic Russian position is that the countries in the region do have interests in Syria. Turkey has some interests, Iran has some interests, Israel has some interests. But these interests need to be moderated. They have to, there's the, in other words, there needs to be uh, a line drawn between um, legitimate interests and uh, wider ambitions. And the legitimate interests should be honored, wider ambitions should be scaled down. So it may be a matter of uh, intense discussion between or among, let's say, Iran, Russia, Syria, Israel, and the United States as to how close some Hezbollah or some uh, Shiite militias should be to the, to the territories controlled by Israel, for example. Uh, Israel was not happy with the agreement reached between the United States and Russia on, uh, on the de-escalation zone in the, south of the southwest of the country. They said it there, you know, brings some people too close for comfort. Um, that, that's an example. Uh, with regard to the issue of Jerusalem, I don't know. I don't think it will be played as a card. I don't think that they see in Moscow today, I may be wrong, but I do not see uh, an intention to seize the American mantle and to, to, to try to relaunch the quartet. Uh, it's seen as a, as a not completely dead, but almost dead issue. And Russia would probably not mess up with that. Uh, you uh, had a question earlier. Okay, my name is uh, Brigadier General Qasim Jamul. Uh, you spoke about, I think we, we spoke together maybe four years ago via Skype when you wrote a paper about the unnatural relation between Russia and Syria. And at that time I opposed your paper and I told you that there is national interests for Russia and Syria regarding uh, the existence of this Marshal and the Navy in Syria, in addition to the gas supplies uh, regarding East Europe and the uh, projects for pipelines through and the reserves in uh, Mediterranean Sea. And now you are speaking about the stand of Russia in Syria as a bazaar. Do you think that after all these four years of your paper, I think you wrote your paper in 2014. Things changed, and now we have facts that Russia is a major power, is a superpower, is at the same stand as the US in the region, if not more. And by the way, I don't think that US have a borders with uh, South Korea or Japan for presence in South Korea. So the facts at the ground now say that Russia is a superpower in the region and it, it is implementing the strategy for its national interests in this area. Thank you. I, I thank you, sir, for uh, bringing up that, um, that old paper. I think it was 2012 that I wrote it. If I, I, may, I may be wrong. 
But uh, in, in that paper, I argued that um, the alliance that people were talking about between Bashar al-Assad and Putin uh, was more of a figment of imagination. There was no alliance, I was arguing in that paper. But we're talking 2012. Uh, many things changed. 2013, I, I was just discussing uh, the idea of uh, some kind of a Dayton-style solution for Syria. 2014, of course, uh, was the year when uh, the U.S. Western, uh, the U.S.-Russian relationship and Russian Russian Western relationship um, has um, broken down. Uh, did broke did break down, and actually cooperation was superseded by confrontation between the United States and Russia, and things uh, changed all of a sudden in a number of areas, and that includes Syria. Uh, I, I reject the description of Russia as a superpower. Russia was a superpower for a period of time. It did not serve Russia particularly well, frankly. And I think that, um, um, that there's a Russian saying, basically, to the effect that twice beaten, uh, once beaten, twice wise, or something like that. So you do not, do not do these things again. Um, Russia is about status. The status is elevated, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, uh, one m makes mistakes if one pushes one's luck too far. And I think that Putin is a very cautious person. And that's why he is, uh, he is winding down Russian military presence. That's why he, from the start, limited that presence to, uh, to the naval forces and the air forces primarily in the, in the combat capacity. So, um, well, I, 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 again, I thank you for, for bringing this up, but I, I would disagree with the notion of Russia as a superpower on the, uh, on the level of the United States. It would be very wrong for Russians to, to start thinking along those lines. Thank you, uh, Michelle Dunn from Carnegie. Uh, Dimitri, I wanted to draw you out a little bit more about Russian involvement um, in, in Libya and in Egypt. So President Putin was in Cairo earlier this week. There were several things discussed. The, uh, the Daban nuclear power plant, which has been on the, on the table and discussed for a long time. The return of civilian flights, uh, which would bring Russian tourists back to Egypt, also discussed for a couple of years now. But another thing has been uh, reports that have been primarily in the Russian media about a Russian request to Egypt for access to its air bases. Um, so the question is, um, why, why, why does Russia want this? What, what use would it be? Uh, is it, in, is it uh, related to action or involvement in Libya or the Horn of Africa? Or what would be, what would be the reason for Russia wanting this access? And uh, it's sort of unclear. Do you know whether it has been granted by Egypt or not? Michelle, it's, it's a very important question. And um, I think this puts the finger on who drives Russia's foreign policy. And I think that the war in Syria has um, greatly empowered uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense within the, uh, uh, the community of decision makers. And I see them as being um, much more influential players in Syria and maybe beyond Syria in, in, in other parts of the Middle East than the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Again, policy is not made either at the Foreign Ministry or at the Ministry of Defense. It's made elsewhere. But there's, uh, there's, an, imp there's an input, there's influence go coming from both those bodies. And I think that the Defense Ministry has been emboldened by these things. I think that the Defense Ministry is um, is um, seeking uh, a much bigger role for Russia uh, globally um, based on uh, also on Russia's presence outside its borders. There, there was also, as you know, there was also uh, a news item 
about Russia seeking um, uh, basing rights in Sudan. The Sudanese president also traveled to Russia, and uh, that was kind of a surprising thing. You know, why would you need? So I see this as part of um, uh, uh, an attempt by the military to use the Syria operation as, um, as their bargaining chip in elevating their position in the internal, uh, we're also talking budget, in the internal, um, uh, edif in, 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 in the internal system of, of policy making in Russia. And um, to me, this is, um, it's, it's not necessarily driven by, uh, you know, some kind of serious calculations and, and all that. It's, I think it's, it's, it's driven by something else. And this is what I personally am, um, am slightly concerned about, slightly at this point, but still concerned. Because uh, if you don't have a valid strategic reason for doing certain things, then, um, then your victory, or what you think is victory, can play a pretty bad joke on you at some, at some point. So I'm, I'm watching that closely, and uh, it's one thing to be um, cooperating uh, with various parties in, in Libya, seeking to, uh, to, uh, to bring those parties to some kind of a negotiating table and win some influence for you, which I think ru what Russia is doing. But it's a totally different thing to expand your, your um, military presence uh, without a good geopolitical rationale. The Soviet Union did have a geopolitical rationale. You could agree or disagree with that, but the Soviet Union did have it. I do not see that geopolitical rationale for Russia, and I'll be watching it very closely. But you put a finger on, uh, on, on a very important issue. We're running out of time, so why don't I take two more questions here and here, since I've been focusing on this side of the room a little more. Thank you. My name is Megan Tribble. I'm a student at AUB. Earlier, we heard about paradigm shift in foreign policy no longer being enacted by national interest, but by more by domestic policy, sort of foreign policy as a reflection of what's going on domestically. Is Russia the last country to be enacting foreign policy based on national interest? Can you speak about the relationship between domestic political considerations within Russia and, and how that shapes or does not shape foreign policy? Um, specifically in, with regards to Syria, should there be increased military casualties, would there be domestic repercussions, and should there be uh, terrorism as a re in, within the borders of Russia as a result of foreign military entanglements, what would the domestic repercussions be? Thanks. Uh, well, certainly there would be repercussions. Um, that's for sure, and, uh, and, and the thought about those uh, repercussions guided Putin's uh, initial strategy on, on Syria. So, absolutely. Um, I think the war in Syria is, is seen by the bulk of, uh, of the Russian people favorably because they, uh, uh, A, they do not um, see many casualties resulting from that war on the Russian side, clearly. We all care primarily about our own. And B, because the war doesn't cost that much compared to other things. The total cost of the war over two years has been, well, to the tune of a uh, billion and a half US dollars, which is not a lot of money compared to other things. Um, but yes, uh, people will be asking questions if things uh, were to turn ugly or if things were to turn uh, into a big burden. Um, yes, absolutely. There is public opinion. But national interest is, uh, I think national interest exists also in countries where the public has uh, a large say in how national foreign policies are, are pursue, pursued. I think the United States operates on the principle of the national interest. Except in, 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 in addition to the, uh, to the concept of, excuse me, 
to the concept of the global order that the United States supports and promotes and, uh, and defends. Uh, but the national interest is there. You, you open any statement by a U.S. leader and you have the national interest there in spades. So I would say the only, the only part of the world where the national interest is not uh, front and center uh, discussing uh, where, where foreign policy or, 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 or uh, defense policy is discussed is, is Europe, essentially. In the rest of the world, you have the national interests uh, as, you know, as a given. Thank you so much, Dmitry. I'm afraid we really have run out of time here. This was a fascinating discussion, and it's Carnegie at its best. <laughs>